Good evening! How you all doing? Let's see who's lurking around today. Darius, hello! And Guillaume Infinisil, Ponder Pimp, Ah oh, Primus, Skinny Seahorse, Slow Cool. Good to have you here. Let's have a play. So, what we're going to be doing today is slightly different. You may have noticed the title, no doobly doo, has changed. Um, we're not going to be pushing any pixels today. Um, I know we've done some episodes which have been under that kind of series, I guess, that weren't related to pixel pushing, but it, this feels like we're kind of stepping out of bounds now. Like, we're not even trying to do anything graphics related in this one. Uh, we're not touching Keppel or any of that kind of stuff. This is kind of curiosity driven uh, thing. So I've made up a new silly name. So we got um, Pilot Perens for that. I couldn't use the little bits of Lisp because that's really for educational stuff. And this is something where I really don't know what the fuck I'm doing, as I'm going to explain at length in a second. And uh, so, yeah, welcome to the other thing that we do. So, yes, I'm wanting to do some uh, SIMD related stuff. We knighted a bit, I actually went on a bit of a rant about this last week, actually. And so I'm, that really, uh, that really got me interested and I had a look. <laughs> hey, kid, good to see you. Um, I had a look again at some of the, uh, the Vops stuff, which we'll get to very soon. Um, and something clicked and I was able to make a tiny bit of progress and then I got really excited. And so I decided to announce doing a SIMD stream um, before I kind of came to my senses and bottled out. Um, so yeah, we're going to be doing this. Caveat time. Um, normally I try to have at least a vague, vague idea of what I'm doing. Um, I am, I have no assembly code writing experience at all. I have no low level uh, experience to speak of. And um, I'm just beginning to get into this kind of area at all. So don't take anything <laughs> that I say in the stream with any credibility at all. Um, also, yes, we're going to be diving into the SBCL bits of the SBCL compiler to see what we can find. I have no idea how the damn thing works. Uh, I've been grepping around a little, but it is quite beyond me. Um, and that's fine. Right? This, these are the streams. Um, this one is really just some hairy fucker trying to learn some things, and you get to hang out. So it's kind of like normal, except that even the pretense that I would have some idea of what's going on has gone away too. So, yes, with that said, we're going to dig into some things. Please don't try... Don't, don't do things in this, get errors, and then go and complain to SBCL people. Kind of just leave them alone. We're, 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 we're screwing around here. Um, yeah, but at the same time, really stoked to be doing this, and glad a few of you have hung out today. Um, oh, you're some of you getting adverts. That's crap. Um, Pond Pimp's not in chat today, but is following the stream. Cool. Um, only have serious chat today. Bah! Rubbish. That's okay, we've got kid in, so we'll be fine. Paul, good evening! Good to have you here. Right, so, what are we trying to do? Basically, the other day I was watching a bunch of... Let's see if I can bring this up. It's going to be a day with, with a lot of links in it. I was watching a bunch of Handmade Hero. Specifically episodes from 115 up to 120. And there's a gap of a few when they go into some multi-threading stuff. Which is actually really good, so watch those as well. And then, um... I think it's around 124 or something, 125. There's a bit more Cindy stuff to do with memory alignment. Phenomenal series. Really well done. Um, but just a really excellent introduction to uh, using SIMD. And that was all done through the Intel intrinsics, which we're getting into soon. Actually, let's just doot, doot. let's just uh, throw these links in the chat. So let's get... Fuck you, Chris. Come on, grab it. There we go. This is going in the chat. There. So there is some Handmade Hero. Uh, we're going to get to this guy in a minute. And I was watching that, and it was really cool. And I was starting to make connections. Oh, yeah. Intel intrinsics. Uh, Intel intrinsics guide. There we go. This thing is super handy. Come on. What is that? Okay. Um, yeah, this is already trusted. Good. So. Do have a look at this as well. Um, looking through this, I was starting to get some idea of how the SIMD stuff was working. And I thought that'd be really cool to try and get the uh, to do in Lisp. And there are some pieces of information about it around. There's no official guide or anything like that. So we're going to try and dig into some stuff. Um, seeing as I was kind of giving the caveats, I'll tell you what I have been doing. I've, a, little, a while ago, actually, before life very much got in the way, 
I had started looking at um, the Intel um, architecture software developers manual. This thing is obviously a beast. It's a ten part, like it's a ten volume. This is volume one of ten. Um, beastie here, highly recommended reading. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I've, I had a peek at that. Didn't get very far just because of life stuff. I would love to carry on reading that. I haven't yet uh, recently because of, oh yeah. If you're interested in optimization stuff as well, you cannot go wrong with uh, Agnafo's um, optimization uh, information. It's a whole bunch of stuff on um, how your um, assembly operate, uh, ah, assembly instructions get broken down to micro ops and push through the whole pipeline all about x86, x86 64. I'm just gonna be saying x64 everywhere all the time, so kind of have to deal with that. It's not gonna be the least wrong thing in today's episode. Um, so highly recommend reading there as well. Um, and finally, because I've been really curious about this stuff, like, so when I got into Lisp, once you've learned the kind of 101, and you, if you've already come from other programming languages before, you know a lot of the basic stuff, like you know what loops are, and you're used to dealing with functions and all that kind of crap. So getting something above, above the 101 kind of stuff um, is a bit tricky. And for me, what really helped um, was going on to the Common Lisp um, section in Stack Overflow and basically reading every question that uh, Rainer Joswig had answered. Because that dude knows fucking everything from the spec. Absolutely everything about, about the Common Lisp standard See, he seems to have in his head. And so whenever a question comes up, there's normally a great answer from him and often a, a good one from someone else as well. Um, it's really impressive. And so finding one of those people who can kind of rely on for answers and then reading all their stuff, even when you don't understand most of it, exposes you to a lot of terminology and gets you going following links. Um, so for the assembly side, this chap, Peter Cordes, is um, one of the moderators on the x86 um, tag in, um, in Stack Overflow. This person's answers are absolutely amazing in general. Um, like, and not just, just, not just being correct, the length that he will go to to explain something properly, breaking it down across architectures and all this kind of stuff, you don't even need to understand it all to be able to get so much from it. And all of these links are hours worth of reading on their own. So highly recommended if you're interested in getting into this stuff. Um, again, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but this stuff has been really interesting so far and has got a lot of kind of terminology thrown at me. Uh, I don't understand most of it yet, of course. Um, but yeah, handy stuff. I really should link this person's thing. So let's just shove that in here as well. Um, so let's check back in the chat because I've been, again, monologuing at you for a bit. Um, da -da 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 -da. Taylor Paul, good evening. First time on Twitch. Yeah, it's really cool to have you. That's great. Are you normally watching on YouTube or is this first time tuning in in general? Good swap to virtual tabs. It's so much better, right? It really is. The only bad thing is making sure that, like, because I end up opening thousands of them and then remembering to save them occasionally. Um, so kids say, you want to learn SIMD? You want to contribute to SBCL? Uh, no, not particularly. I mean, I would love to get to the point where I could do that, but that's not the goal. I just want to do some stuff in Lisp and, you know, got to go fast. Uh, Arsus X64 does seem a lot more convenient to say. Right, exactly. Like, we've got to do this speaking thing every now and again, so it's, uh, it's better to deal with that. Um... And some good blog on SIMD uh, with SBCL can be found at pvk.ca, which I think is this. Yeah, um, this chap, um, I can't remember how to pronounce this name. Kuang? Kuang? Nope, it's gone. Never mind. Um, really smart dude. I, I tried to, I, I saw his SBCL stuff and I could follow it reasonably well. And then I tried to read some of the other stuff he's into and just absolutely impossible. Haven't felt that stupid in a long time. And I, I don't know. <laughs> I get opportunities often enough. Um, okay, so we're gonna be looking a bit at this and we're just kind of be bouncing around. Another thing um, that might be a useful resource 
is this unofficial SPCL wiki. Um, Guicho, uh, Guio? How do I say that? Not too sure. Anyway, um, sorry if you're watching. Um, yes, uh, has been starting to dig through the uh, SPCL compiler and has put some things in here. One of the things that gets very confusing very quickly when you're going into that compiler is there are a lot of three-letter acronyms used everywhere and you want to know what they mean. There is a three-letter acronym file, but it's handily named TLA. Uh, if you didn't know that was the three-letter acronym for three-letter acronym, it's kind of annoying to find. Um, I mean, yep, it, it, it caught me out for a few minutes and not a lot of them are actually in there. There's a, a bunch of things um, that they're missing. So we've tried to compile um, a list of such things. Wait a second, has something changed recently? No. So, um, where's the in irritating shorthands? I didn't come up with that title. But these are a few of the things you're gonna find. Some of these are in the TLA file, some of them are not. Um, especially the pluralizations were ones that caught me out for a while. TNS is just the plural of TN and things like this. We'll bump into this soon enough. I know there's a lot of preamble this time, but again, I'm not really sure what I'm doing, so we're just gonna, we're gonna feel our way around this. Um, Darius is saying, God damn, so much stuff to read. Right, right, and I'm on a deadline. I can't be doing this, uh, but it's still cool. So, YouTube, cool. Thanks for making it over to Twitch, that's awesome. But I'm really glad. It's been really cool to see how many people do watch on YouTube as well. Hello, YouTube fans. Um, <laughs> kids say anime is basically just a long monologue, so this is anime. <laughs> sure, why not? Um, Teleports was saying, uh, sorry, I keep messing up your name as well. Names are definitely not my strong point. I've been learning closure, but Lisp is, um, has a magnetic attraction. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool, man. It's really good. Um, yeah, kid, I've had the same problem with the vertical tabs thing. It's, it's a bit of a bummer. Right, so, where to start? Um, SVCL allows you to um, con like emit um, assembly routines um, by means of this thing called a virtual operation. So this is at the kind of low levels uh, of the compiler. Like, so your, your Lisp code kind of gets read in and gets turned into um, ostensibly lists, lists to begin with. That's the kind of AST-ish thing that we all work with. And then obviously it goes into the compiler and the real fun begins. Um, they're gonna go and make a proper AST and decorate it with loads of information and then process it a whole bunch. There's loads of things they do. Your kind of dead code removal and constant folding for the simple stuff. And they probably do kind of loop of variant code motion to move things outside loops if they're constant for the loop. Again, I can't tell you what exactly SBCL is doing, but they do a whole bunch of processing and it's reason um, that SBCL is one of the faster um, compilers, not fast to compile, it's one of the slower ones to compile. Um, actually, it's not that bad. It's faster than ECL. Um, but it is, um, yeah, generates pretty good code. Very good for a dynamic language. Um, so yes, lower down, they seem to have um, these VOPs. And I think this is in, I'm trying to remember the order round, because which way around it is, because you have, everything's read in, you get your AST, and you've got a couple of intermediate representations. So IR1, IR2, and I think IR2 is the lower level one. Um, we'll probably find this out as we go along. Um, and so, yes. Oh, by the way, of course, we're dealing with uh, internals of the compiler, so do not expect this to be stable across many versions. Um, we're kind of in Here Be Dragon's Land. However, saying that, we looked at SBCGA last week, which is a maths library that's been using SIMD stuff for ages. So, some of it's clearly kind of stable. Um... Now, I'm trying to remember... Sambler... I remember reading something by Paul talking about what is extensible in SBCL and, um, and what isn't, as far as kind of stuff lower down. Um, let's have a look. Archives. I wonder if he's got any tags. Um, let's just look at SBCL. How to find new intrinsics in SBCL. This was a really cool article as well. Highly recommended. Let's throw this into chat too. Um, because that is roughly what we're doing. Hey, AK Karam, good to see you. Okay, so this Stack Overflow 
Post points to an obscure and undocumented weakness in Intel's implementation of Popgun. Didn't they have like a fake dependency on, or a false dependency on some, something else? Yes, schedules it though is also dependent on the destination. So they basically a bug in in your uh, in your CPU. Um, so yeah, SPCL easily supports this use case, which is extending um, and, and kind of fixing things in the compiler without having to re-release or even recompile the implementation. VOPs, virtual operations, execute arbitrary CL code during code generation, and they can be defined at runtime, which for us is like, we can define things, compile them, and then we can start using them. Um, so yes, the first step is to make sure that SPCL's assembler knows how to um, um, emit pop count. Uh, the assembler can also be extended at runtime, but that's more hairy a topic for another post. That was the thing I was trying to remember. So ex extending the assembler is a bit more of an ass. Um, he hasn't done a post on this yet, as far as I can remember. Um, but the VOPs are pretty easy. And we're going to... Well, relatively easy for what we're, we're giving, given some really powerful tools. So, let's go and have a look at something... Um, when he was talking about SSE intrinsics, down here there was an example of an add instruction down here. So this is a uh, four, like an addition of four floats. Now, SPCL seems to have these packed types. So in, from what I've been able to see, these SIMD packed single, it's four floats packed together. If we go and have a look for this actually, because we're going to be grepping uh, through the compiler a lot today. So if you're going to do this, highly recommend um, cloning SPCL. Um, you'll probably want to add something like this um, to your .sbcl um, RC file, which just tells it where the source is. Because that's going to allow you to do jump to definition into the compiler, which is, again is super useful. So let's go and have a look. For SIMD packed single, let's save this and go on a dig. So, this looks compelling. Source compiler x86-64 SIMD pack. Um, and here we have a function which again looks useful. It's a VOP. Um, and, and we see a pattern here which we're going to um, see again. Is we have a definition of a VOP with this translate bit defined with the same name. And then we see a function which looks recursive. All it does is um, call ostensibly itself. But what's actually happening is the way this has been set up, this ends up kind of becoming a wrapper for this VOP that you can actually call. So if we do make SIMD pack single, and we're going to just jump into um, this project that I've been using. Um, this is a little bit tight on room. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to change this to scratch, move over here, split this, bring on the REPL, and then we'll try again. Cool. So we've got make SIMD pack single. One, two, three, four. Um, and they're not single floats, of course. So let's just fix that. All right. And what we get is this object. Now, this is um, this data boxed. These SIMD packs seem to be like in um, the Intel intrinsics, if I just jump back here, where are we? Intel intrinsic guides. Um, these underscore underscore M128i is a pack of um, four 32-bit integers. And you'll find underscore underscore um, 128 is a pack of four floats. So this is the SIMD packed um, single, so single, um, single float rather than double. Single, um, blah. Word's gone there. Um, dun, 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 dun. Let's go through. What's good? SP cell is pretty darn fast considering. It certainly is. It's really cool. Um, AK Graham's been doing Korean classes. Cool, man. How's that going? Um, AK Graham, although I'd managed to read Object Oriented Programming in CL by, um, by Keen recently. Oh, cool. Great read, apparently. Nice. Regarding VOPs, I came across them in Ironclad. Oh, yeah, that was an um, that was an encryption thing, right? Let's have a look. 
Let's bring this link up here because we might need this. Ooh, wow, that's a beastie. Okay, we'll come back to this one. <laughs> we'll come back to that. So, at this point, this was kind of cool. So we've got a thing which can take some floats, or I assume takes some ints. Like, if we look down here, say I assume. I know I've looked in here before for a few things. So we go make uh, simd pack whatever. We've got singles. We have um, UB64, which I'm guessing is going to be unsigned byte. 64-bit unsigned byte. Um, UB32. And we can see a few things that kind of make sense straight away. Like if we uh, we look at this, make SIMD pack UB64. Uh, um, like as, at SIMD register in this case, the um, SSC2 ones that we're kind of interested in um, have 128 bits, 128 bits wide. So you could fit in four floats or two doubles or, you know, keep going with that kind of idea. Um, so here we can see that you're going to be passing in two um, 64 bit integers. Um, the arguments here, low and high. The SCS, um, the S here is pluralization. SC stands for storage class, as best as I can figure. And is really talking about the kind of register. If we jump back to the wiki, the unofficial wiki, uh, where we just copied a bunch of stuff around. Let's have a look. Shorthand. We go down in here. Storage base and storage class. So this is, I think we copied this from a comment in uh, the compiler. So a storage class um, is a potentially arbitrary set of elements in a storage base. So what's storage base? Storage base represents a physical storage resource such as a register set or stack frame. Cool, right. So we're talking about registers or stack frames in some way here. Um, it's a potentially arbitrary set of these things. Although conceptually there might be a hierarchy of storage classes, um, such as all registers, box registers, and box scratch registers, this doesn't exist at the implementation level. Such things can be done by specifying storage classes whose locations overlap. Not entirely sure know what to make out of that yet, but again, we'll learn in time, I guess. A temporary TN, this is a temporary name, um, shouldn't have lots of overlapping SCs as storage classes as legal storage classes since time would be basically repeatedly attempting to pack into the same location. Again, I vaguely understand, I at least understand it from a wording point of view. The implications are kind of beyond me. So temporary names, I'm again, this, this is a guess. Um, when we have something like this, we say let A is whatever. And we have this. Clearly, the machine's not going to be doing all of this in one go. Um, there's going to be a bunch of... Um, assembly instructions omitted and data just can't be floating in ether right so it's gonna have to be somewhere whether it's in memory like what cached or otherwise or in a register it has to be somewhere um, so when we do that multiply here the result of this has to be stored somewhere and those kind of um, conceptually it seems to be and again basing this off a couple of things I've seen in compiler stuff um, a temporary is like basically like a made-up variable where this will be stored. So if we expanded this, so it was like g0 was this, and then this was g0. g0, uh, like, it's almost like using gensim, really. You're just getting a temporary variable here. Um, so these, I think, are our temporaries. They call them temporary names inside um, SBCL. And I'm not sure if, again, I'm not sure if that pertains to, it's kind of like a binding or whatever it is, but that, that's what they seem to call them, temporary names. And I think I've seen that terminology and other things as well. I had a little poke around in LVM trying to understand how they do some of their optimization passes. Because I'm interested in that kind of shit. Also, I probably could get together a bunch of um, videos and talks of stuff that are also interesting. Oh, one link I haven't mentioned so far, which is really useful, is what every programmer um, should know. It'll fix it. About memory, I think that's what it's called. Yes, this is fucking amazing. This is an amazing article. And while I slightly disagree with the title, because, like, you know what? Not everyone need, um, who's making a website needs to know about, let's see if I can get to it straight away, how, trans how memory is made um, in a kind of abstract state, abstract sense. If you're interested in how machines work, 
uh, how your computer works, this is an amazing article to read. It's high level enough that it's very useful. It's not specifically tied to a single architecture. And there's just so much valuable shit in here if you want to understand why certain things are faster than others and stuff like this. There's a whole bunch of information and then they just go through test after test explaining and showing and proving like why things perform in certain ways. Really highly recommend it. It's a fantastic read. I've I've only read it once so far, so I'm gonna have to read through it a couple more times before it really starts to stick. Uh, to stick, but we will see. Love like Sandex. Good to have you, man. Um. Okay, so where did we get to? Yes, we've got a packed signal. So like this is really representing. I mean, it's boxed now because it's had to be returned from a function. Um, but. Ultimately, this value is going to be stored in a register. Um, let's just go back to a little bit of a test that I did have already. Um, so, okay. So just like this packs from for floats, one thing I did get working was I wanted to make a SIMD pack single from a system area pointer. So I want to take a pointer. I want to take the four values that are contiguous in memory from that pointer from where that pointer points to and load those into a into a pack and this is my attempt at that and i'm not sure it's right but it does work um so just to show that uh we have a test function down here all it does it calls um make simd pack single from sap passing in a pointer and then it prints out the result in fact let's uh, just make another quick test function so we don't have to make our memory each time. So test2 is going to be let pointer. We'll use the FFI to um, allocate some memory. We're going to... Now it's going to be a bit weird. I'm actually going to allocate 100 floats. And the reason is that I know that SBCL, if you're making short arrays of um, data, will actually stack allocate them. And this doesn't... This... this um, this can mean that the alignment is not, it, it can mean it's not 16 by aligned. It, it's wherever it is on the stack. And I'm not sure what the details are for that. And I'm not sure if you can influence it in any way to get it um, aligned. Um, but in my previous playing around, I found that if I just made a big buffer, um, it got put on the heap and, or, and then uh, things seem to be aligned. Again, I have no idea actually if this is what is happening. Um, but when I was poking around with it and I was getting crashes that I didn't expect it and changing the length made that difference, it seemed like the most logical thing. It's also awesome that um, SBCL will stack, stack allocate foreign allocations if they make sense and it can prove that it's not going to be handing them off um, like if they're only dynamically scoped, for example. Anyway, so we've got this foreign alloc uh, and then we're going to call test um, with that pointer. Now we want some data to be there. So let's just do, what the fuck did Peredit stop working? That was weird. Thank you. Um, set F, um, do I have CFFI in here? It's like mem a ref. No, okay, so I have to do CFFI mem a ref. Um, the pointer is PTR, the type is float, and the index is zero. Oops, index needs to be in there. And we're going to set this value to 1. Yeah. And let's set the first four floats. So 3, 2, 1. 3, 4. What have I done wrong? Foreign alloc. I think, yes, because this has keyword arguments and this was meant to be count 100 like that. Um, and then also free isn't defined because this should be see if I foreign free okay so let's run that make simd pack single and now i'm going to do test two which immediately gets it wrong what the fuck did i do there oh crap okay so i'm calling a different function one second ah what the fuck have i done okay hold on hold on see if i can get this to work What's going on here? Oh, my VOP's wrong. Well, that's disappointing. SIMD pack single is not a defined primitive type. Oh. It seems I have not pushed some stuff from... Um, 
my other machine. <laughs> I was doing some stuff with my laptop the other day and I thought I had this set up. I'm not sure where this comes from. I think it's probably here. Let's do this. Okay, so that's compiling now. Let's try this again. So we're getting two compiler notes telling us that at this point, I'm not sure if you saw that in the mini buffer, doing SSE to pointer coercion. So what's happening here is we ostensibly are taking the values from this pointer, we're making a one of those SIMD packs out of them, and we've got them here. Now at this point, it's probably just stored in a register or something like this, but at this point, it actually has to be passed off to another function. And then um, we're having to coerce it into another type. Basically, this is, you're paying some boxing cost. So you're having to pull the value out, spill it, like get, uh, put it in memory, box that up, and then pass it off to print. Um, and this gives a similar warning. Um, I'm not sure it, how correct that is because like, it makes sense if you were just calling this function on its own, you will definitely get that cost. But we also see that we don't get that warning here, which makes me think that when it's used like this, um, it's fine. As soon as you're trying to pass the result off somewhere else, you're gonna get this issue. But let's just try that thing again. So we make a SIMD pack single to show what that looks like, and then we go test two. Um, and yes, here we go. It's showing another SIMD pack full of one, two, three, four. Um, those are our floating point numbers. And that's from this function here. So there's no reason for that to say 10. Um, yeah. Cool, so what's going on here? As far as I can tell, um, Ekigram says, I've tried looking up the docs regarding alignment in SBCL, but there isn't much. Does anyone have some links regarding this? I don't think it's out there because, again, it's not really their requirement to provide that information. I mean, the SBCL manual is really about um, what they as a Lisp implementation kind of provide, um, not any other details lower down, as far as I know. They do provide some amazing stuff. I mean, they're, like, they're threading stuff, like all the like atomics and semaphores and stuff are defined, which is awesome, and memory barriers. It's great. It's going to be so much fun. Guillaume, have you not been seeing the stream? That's strange. Uh, and I gave you a shout out at the beginning and everything. Um, Medianne, hello. All right, so let's see if I can, if we can work out how this VOP thing works. So define VOP is a big old macro from inside the compiler. And there's a bunch of these kind of uh, forms in here that start with different keywords. And so we're just gonna go through and see roughly what um, they mean. So there is, I might reorder this so it actually matches this order because it might be a little easier to read. If we take args, where is it? Args, let me move this up to the top. Ah, uh, oh no, fuck it, let's just, let's just jump around because I'm gonna get confused otherwise. Let's start with looking at translate. Boop, 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 it's gonna be around here somewhere. Translate takes a name. This option causes the VOP template to be entered as an IR2 translation for the named functions. Right, so first thing we have up here is something called def known. Let's just jump there and see if there's a good explanation of what this is. Um, right, this macro should be the way that all implementation independent information about functions is made known to the compiler. So this is about telling um, the compiler stuff about a function. Declare the function name to be a known function. We construct a type specifier for the function. Um, and we do some stuff, attributes, none about to list of stuff, la la la. You'll see me la 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 a lot because whenever it gets too confusing or if I'm skipping over stuff, like we're just trying to get some information here. Um, okay, so. Def known to me so far has seemed like a fancy declaim um, that the compiler uses internally. So you can specify things like the type of the function. This function takes um, an unsigned byte 32 and a system area pointer as its arguments and it returns a SIMD pack of single float. Now I'm not sure in this case why it has to be uh, parameterized like this. I actually like this kind of, um, I can't remember what they call this, a type form maybe. Um, but in some places I see the type as SIMD pack single, 
and some of them I see simply pack single float. And it really matters, especially in Def Known, what it's called. Because I had some, when making this, I had some weird problems where it wouldn't recognize that this function was referring to this unless I had these types set up like this. Anyway, we define the types of the function um, and then we give the compiler some information about it. Um, I haven't, I, I don't know in this case what these mean. I stole it from another example. It's flushable, movable, and foldable. Now, to me, flushable might mean that um, this thing can be removed um, by the dead code eliminator. Maybe that's what it is. We'll have to go look. Movable again, can, like the compiler tries to move a lot of code around to make things more efficient or for various other reasons in transforms. Maybe that allows it to do that. And foldable, Again, maybe this allows combining with other functions. I'm not really sure, um, but we can dig into this. But it does seem to be a way of specifying um, things to the compiler that is allowed to do with this function. And this says overwrite function database silently true. The FNDB is function database. I'm not even sure if we have that in the um, in the shorthand documentation yet. FNDB. No. Okay. Right. So let's do that quickly. BCD FNDB Nice. Um, and that's because we're going to be recompiling this a bunch and we don't want it to complain. So this is kind of an ahead, like a um, forward declaration of a function, kind of like declaim allows you to do. Um, so we define this function is going to exist and we define its types and all that kind of stuff. Then we define the VOP and we say that using translate here, this option causes the VOP template to be entered as an IR2 intermediate representation 2, which is the kind of lower level part, uh, translation for the named function. Cool. So this is going to be what this function um, translates to, I guess. Policy. Let's go and see what policy means. Specifies the policy under which this VOP is the best translation. Again, so you might prefer that the compiler is generating small code or fast code or safe code. Um, those are the kind of things when you're specifying optimize in a function, like down here when you're specifying optimize and debug and stuff like this. Um, that's what you're doing there. So I think that relates to that. Um, so if it's trying to be fast and safe. Yeah, we're just telling you what are the properties of this VOP. So this is appropriate when you're trying to be fast and safe, it seems. That's cool. Um, we have the arguments. Again, so we have the index, which is an unsigned register, which is capable of holding our unsigned... See, I don't know why it's an unsigned num here. I need to look into what that is, um, because once we get inside the compiler, the types that we're really interested in talking about change. Um, because in Lisp, we have a lot of types which are kind of, I don't know, I guess fairly generic, like our integer type um, holds any size integer. Obviously, when it's compiled to actually run on a machine, there must be specific, it must have a specific representation. And even though it'll overflow, um, Safely, like if you if you say it's an unsigned um, eight bit number, right, and then you overflow that, it promotes it up to a bigger type. So you always get a safe number up to big numbers, and then you're kind of, well, you can have any size number there. It seems. Um, so, yes, so we have the kind of um, surface Lisp types, and then inside the compiler there are other types um, at the different IR levels, and I don't really know the details of that yet. Um, so we'll have to find out more about that. It does seem to relate to um, uh, Lisp types in general. So this system area pointer, um, that's the type that we'll see. Um, if we just go to the REPL and we look at CFFI uh, foreign pointer and jump to that, you can see for SPCL, it's defined as the system area pointer. So that is the Lisp type for that thing in SBCL. So I guess unsigned num is also a thing somewhere, but I don't know where it is. Uh, oh, we can jump to definition for system area pointer though. 
that's we're in host alien so aliens when it's talking about alien we're talking about ffi in um or foreign code in sbcl so let's grep again and see where unsigned num comes into it because it's kind of weird that it doesn't it doesn't seem to express a size um And the reason I used it is just because I saw some other code using it. I don't know if it's the right choice. Da, 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 da. Or, like all of these things look a lot to me like vops. See result types, arg types, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, bloody hell. I'm not sure where to look for. Ah. Def. Here we go. What's this? Okay, so it's defining some... Oh, fucking hell, what's this? Oh, no, that was defining unsigned byte 64 count using unsigned num. That didn't help. Damn. Okay. I don't know what that actually refers to yet. We'll find out another day, and when we know, we can add it to the wiki or something. So anyway, there's some unsigned number being passed in. There's some system area pointer. It's being stored into an unsigned reg. I'm assuming that this has some logic for knowing um, the right register for use to, to use for this specific unsigned number. Um, we'll find out, I guess. But we're not going to find all this stuff out today, of course. We've got to, like, I, I've tried digging into this before, and it tends to, I tend to find it very slow going, just because I don't you know what I'm doing but if you people have any information do feel free to uh shout out ho 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 man I think flushable is more like related to CPU code cache really that's interesting oh okay hmm I'll keep an eye out for that that might actually um yeah we can if we keep that in mind then if we spot something in the compiler that seems to suggest that that could prove the theory anyway so we've got policies we've got arguments um, arguments can also have a target, so let's go and look at that. Um, so here, when you specify args and results, they, they have the same format. You can see args here and um, results here. Both of them define SCS for a start. Um, and the SCSs, storage classes, um, Storage classes specifies um, good storage classes for this operand. Other storage classes will be penalized according to move costs. Um, a loaded temporary name will be allocated if necessary, guaranteeing that the operand is always one of the specified um, storage classes. So that's cool. If necessary, or create a temporary name. So basically that's saying we don't have to think about that. Um, I don't know... I haven't used, seen uh, load TN used around for before. So load TN is bound to the load TN allocated for this operand. No idea. We'll get there. Load if expression. Let's not dive too deep into this now. <laughs> um, target. That's what we're interested in. Operand. This operand is targeted to the named operand, indicating a desire to pack in the same location, not legal for results. So this is saying our index that we've passed in here, we're targeting IDX. IDX is this temporary down here. Again, because I didn't really know what I was doing, I saw this use of temporaries, and it seemed like at least a safe thing to do. We can look at removing this and see what happens. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm just saying, okay, I need a, um, I need a temporary name um, to store this index into. Again, it's storage class. It only has one storage class in this case. I'm not entirely sure why a VOP can have multiple different storage classes for a single argument. Again, that's... Again, just flexibility stuff and features they have that I'm not aware of, um, or at least, or at least they, it's good, very possible that they've explained it and I just didn't understand, um, because most of this stuff I don't understand. But um, where are we? We're at 2044. Cool. So we've got this unsigned register, which is a temporary. Um, we've said from argument zero, which is referring to this index one here. Um, from and to are uh, related, and we'll see them in different cases, specifies the beginning or end of the operand's lifetime. From can only be used with results. Oh, and two only with arguments. Oh, maybe I'm using this incorrectly then. I'm pretty sure I saw this being used in um, 
in here. Yeah, see, like, um, here's uh, make simd pack double. It's using from argument one. So... Oh, but this is part of temporary, not part of args. Sorry, my bad. Let's let's go down to temporary. Um, temporary has from and to. Similar to the argument result option, this specifies the start and end of the temporary's lives. Uh, the defaults are load and save, um, i.e. the duration of the VOP. The, uh, the other intervening phases are argument, eval, and result. Uh, Non-zero subphases can be specified by a list... Da, 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 da. Okay, so... You don't want to keep registers, um, to assume registers are being used for longer than you need to. I guess this provides that kind of information to the compiler. Um, when I looked into other compiler stuff before, like register lifetimes, um, like like alloc assigning registers uh, um, to various temporaries is one of the things that a compiler will do because you've only got a very limited number of registers and you've got a whole bunch of things you want to store in them. So working out their lifespans and working out when you can reuse a register is very important. It's one of the, again, one of the really fundamental things that a compiler does for you. So we just don't have to worry about registers when we're writing, which is great. Um, so this is just saying that this temporary needs to last from at least when this comes into play. And I'm not sure what that really means, as is kind of like the chorus. I'm not sure what it really means is the theme for today. Um, but yes, that seems to be cool. So we have this, we have some arguments. Uh, we specify the types. Again, double float in this case. Oh, wait a second, we're looking at someone else's code now. Let's jump back. Um, so this is, these are the storage classes, and then these are the Lisp types. Uh, for these arguments. And then we have the temporary that we were talking about. Um, we have the results, which is I've just called DST for destination, um, because again, instructions normally have like the first argument in like Intel syntax normally is like a destination, and then you have some uh, other operand that's being applied to it in some way. Um, so, and again, the SCS for that is a single SSE register. Now, it seems to know, again, it's single here, um, I guess it's the single float stuff rather than double float. Um, so that's cool. So that does actually give it enough information to pick that precisely. Um, whereas something like unsigned register, I'm not sure how it's picking the right size there. But then saying that, wait a second, am I being dumb? Because registers are... Aren't a bunch of the registers actually just the same size anyway? Like, if I remember Intel register stuff, like, they're... Each of them are... Oh, each time they've gone up in size, they alias the other ones. So when you're talking about smaller registers, you're really just talking about the lower... the least significant bits of the larger registers. Um, isn't that right? I actually don't know. I'm pretty sure it is, though. So maybe that's it. Maybe you just have unsigned register, and it's something that can hold an unsigned value. And again, because SBCL is compiling to lots of targets, it makes it more, um, obviously it makes it harder for them. They do a fantastic job of this. Um, but it also makes it tricky for us as noobs walking into this code base to understand um, when they're being more generic and when they just don't need to be more specific. I think that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Um, but destination, cool. And the result types, this is the Lisp type for the value is simd pack single. Um, and then we've got the actual fun bit. This is a generator. The first thing in the generator is a cost. Specifies the translation into assembly code. Cost is the estimated cost of the code emitted by this generator. And because I think it's so, you can have lots of VOPs with different costs and it can pick the best cost based on certain things. Um, so that's good to know. I think it's that. It might be mentioned in here. Okay, generator defines the cost of each variant. The compiler will choose the applicable variant with the least cost and execute the code sequence uh, that follows to convert call to negate in this machine code. So the thing he's doing up here, defining a bunch of ops. And we can see that a bunch of them define the same translate. So there is a function, I guess, that he's defining called um, percent negate. And a bunch of different implementations for different cases. 
This is interesting. And then it's picking the correct one based on type, I guess, and also the cost in the different cases. Probably worth digging back into this um, again sometime soon. This is then run. The rest of this is like is run just as code. So if we look at that a uh, bit from Ironclad that we saw, where was that? Oh yeah, that was over here, wasn't it? We saw that the generator had this big old beefy block here. Now obviously this isn't the code that's being written into the final thing because we need to emit assembly code to, for our for our machine. Um, this is kind of like how you have macros. This is a bunch of code that's going to be run whose job is to emit instructions. And I think that seems to be done with the inst function here and a bunch of other things. Like here they're emitting a label. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know you could emit labels like that. That's neat. Okay. Um, and they have a bunch of condi conditionals in here for different things. When we looked at... Um, when we saw this first one here when he's talking about SSE intrinsics in the thing and how to wrap them up. You can see the use of a cond here, and there we're checking if the location of R, which is the result, and Y, um, which is one of the arguments, is the same, then emit um, this instruction, and otherwise emit, like, emit the move and then the instruction here. So that's kind of interesting. Now, makes me, I'm just going to grab this, actually, and go and drop this into Emacs so I can have a look at it a bit more easily. Because I want to understand why, why in this case. Because the result has been defined as R, and then the target is R. So, target was to inform the compiler that you would like this and this to share the same register if possible. So I would have expected location equals to be compared to R and X. And if it was X, then adding Y into X like this. And otherwise you want to move X to the result uh, register and then you want to admit a, um, this is a packed single add. Um, no, sorry, packed. Yes, single float, packed, add of these two registers. Um, if we just take add ps, we can go to the Intel intrinsics, and this is where this thing starts getting really handy. I think we can search by... Can't do it by that? Oh, come on. Probably want something like... Come on, where's add for... Add for just M128s. These are integers, these are doubles, these are MMX registers, which are aliased with floating point registers, if I remember correctly. So, can't use those. Load, 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 add. 124. Where's the bloody add instruction? Am I being totally blind? SSE2, SSE3. Oh, wait. Oh, no, 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 SSE. Because I only had SSE2, it was only showing me the instructions that were added for SSE2. If we include SSE, then this gets much easier, and we can go and find add PS, which is right here. So we're trying to build something analogous to um, what Intel provide C and C++ programmers kind of as a live, like out of the box kind of thing, as a library anyway. Um, you can include their headers, and then you can use these intrinsics which essentially boil down to one or a few instructions. Um, so in this case, mmAddPS is going, to, is going to be using addPS, which is the instruction that we just saw. Um, and it's going to be taking two, um, in our terminology, uh, simd packed singles, yes, that, and returning one as well. Now, the instruction itself, as you can see here, doesn't, they don't have returns, right? So it takes this value and adds it to this value, and this value is mutated. So when we're doing stuff here, 
um, we're looking to create another temporary that we can um, we can write into. So, so yeah, I'm just kind of interested in why, just why it's done this way. So if r is equal to y, this is probably correct because it's very unlike Paul to be wrong. So I'm wondering why that is. Um, oh, Guillaume. Ho Ho Man's linked a um, one of Paul's articles on making a tiny fourth uh, interpreter. Yeah, it's it's fucking nuts. It's inc it's just incredible that stuff. Um, I would love to get to that point. AK hey, Cram said, if someone wrote a book on this stuff, I'd buy it in an instant. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, AK hey, Graham says, I've tried digging into SBC as well, but felt like I was running into a brick wall. Totally. Um, I'm, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm making tiny bits of progress, but really I need to just understand assembly better so I can find a corner and work out from it. I'm hoping this ends up being the first place I can understand something. Um, Guillaume is saying that uh, flushable means the code can be flushed as dead code by the compiler. Huh. Okay. That was actually in one of the things that we're looking at. That just shows I have not remembered properly. Oh, they only mention it there. Ah, here we go. Right. The last form adds three new functions. This is when it's talking about def known. I should have just gone through this, really, shouldn't I? It's much better. Much more reliable source of information. Each function accepts two packs of single floats as arguments returned another, another single float pack. The results of the, element -y yeah, the results of the element-wise addition, multiplication, or subtraction. Moreover, the function can be reordered and flushed. So that might be movable. As dead code by the compiler. And whenever they appear in code, they should be ultimately translated into assembly code. Always translatable. That's interesting. The last bit is so the runtime system silently overwrites this bit here. Um, silently overwrites the database if functions are already there rather than warning at load time. That makes sense as well. Next we add a template, which is VOP. So these are, they do talk about these as templates. First line um, defines a VOP with a name. It's an arbitrary symbol, and the important bit only is to avoid collision. So don't use the same name as something else. But good naming is useful when reading compiler traces or optimization notes. Nice. Then we specify that it can be autom that it's to automatically to be automatically considered when there is a call to this, which is that translate thing uh, that we looked at. Template converts a call with two arguments x and y that must both be in SSC registers of single floats right and really I guess we should get to this kind of next now we've got, like I want to finish off looking at the thing that I had um, but then I want to get to this pretty quickly actually because this is getting to be really useful and I'm just kind of distracting myself with this so let's stop that let's get back to here we get down to the generator and it's going to emit some code the first thing it does is it generates a move um, of the for the value in the argument index to the temporary IDX that we defined here. And then it does a move APS um, instruction. Let's see if I can go and find a move APS, which is a move, move aligned packed single precision floating point values. Actually, we could actually do the stack allocated thing and then just use move unaligned, but this will work for now anyway. Moves the double word containing four packed single precision floating point values from the source operand, um, the second operand here, um, to the destination operand, the first operand, boop, here. This instruction can be used to load XM registers from um, the 120-bit 8-bit memory location 
to store the contents of an XM register into uh, a memory location or to move data between two XM registers, XWM registers. So in this case, I'm wanting to move from this pointer, whatever the stuff is there, I want to move that into the destination that I've defined here. And this is computing the effective address. Um, the reason I pass in index is it's kind of like, um, again, indexing by byte into that, um, treating it like an array, basically. Um, it's what I was doing at the time for my experiment. It doesn't necessarily make sense, uh, but it was a good test. So anyway, in, in the case that we have here, where we just pass in zero, uh, we're just going to be effectively reading from this pointer and reading full floats into this destination, which is going to be a SIMD register. So we've done def known, we compile that. We do a def define vop and we compile that. And then we define a function that looks recursive and it just calls itself. And it's got a warning just saying there's a cost when it returns. If it were, if it were to return this SIMD thing, there would be a cost there. And then we have our test function, which all it does is it calls this with the pointer that's passed in and it prints the thing. Um, and if we do a um, slime disassemble symbol, um, we can see in here our move uh, APS instruction. Um, and we've got a little bit like this is the uh, so RCX register is must be is probably holding our offset. RAX is going to be um, holding our uh, memory address. And so this is talking about the memory at this address, and it's going to be moved. Four floats going to be moved into the XM00 register. And then we see this used again lower down, where it takes the value that's in XM00 and moves it back to this memory location. And that's because we've got this print here. And so it now needs to get it back. Then it's going to box it up and do a bunch of stuff. And then um, there will be a call down here somewhere. And this is the call to print. So... That seems to make some degree of sense. Um, Guillaume is saying add PS is add pack single float on 256 bits SSE registers. 128, yeah, it's 128. Um, are we sure that make EA produces an aligned pointer? Um, it's, does the, I mean, no, no, we don't guarantee that at all. If not, there would be an error. Definitely, yes. Um, in this case, I'm, I only had it there as a kind of test, so I would increment in steps of four. I would just pass in four, eight, whatever. Um, but in this case, we're just uh, passing in zero and kind of relying on pointer being a 16-bit uh, aligned. Um, I think it's 16-bit. What's the uh, alignment here? Six, sorry, 16 byte. The opera must be aligned on a 16 byte boundary. Um, yeah, or an exception is generated. Two. Um, so it seems that when I allocate it like this, we do get that. Um, the other thing to do was we could just allocate some memory and then we could, you know, we could increment up create a second pointer which is incremented at the first and get it on that alignment boundary and only use the memory from there. I mean, like, I'm not really sure how to do it in a better way. I'm not sure if there's... A, there's probably is a function in SBCL to request aligned memory. I don't know what it is. Um, we can probably find that out. There might even be a way to tell the... Um, tell SBCL that we want the stack value to be aligned in a certain way within the stack. Who knows? We get to explore all this stuff over time, which is fun. So that seems to get us some values in from a pointer. We don't really need that today. Um, so I'm just going to make another foo.list function. Um, but it was interesting to look at it from an um, introduction to vops thing. Um, and it got us to jump into the compiler and have a look at things. Because there is information there. It can just be fairly tricky at first. So let's go in here. And let's have a look at um, how pull does this properly will be the answer. Um, so here, here's defining. 
uh, something that takes some functions that take SIMD packs of single floats and he's defining three functions. I didn't know you could do that with def, def known. That's awesome. And they all return SIMD packs of single floats and they are movable, flushable, and always translatable, which we covered a few minutes ago. Or we saw at least a few minutes ago. Um... It's the int and overwrites the database. Now it says the database. I'm not sure. Like to me, fn would be function, and I don't think database is mentioned in the compiler's database. Fn db. I wonder if it is actually functions or if it's a lot more than that. Um, let's just say it's the compiler's database. Uh, if we go back to that wiki, where is it? Irritational hands. Edit. Let's go down to FNDB. And then we can do the compiler's database and then function database? Who knows? Somebody knows. Okay, so we have this. And let's go back to the article and see what happens next. Next, we define a template, VOP, to convert calls uh, to F plus into assembly code. This task is so deeply tied with the internals, it makes sense to just do it with an FBVM. I don't actually do this. I have another package here which is just pulling in the symbols I need. This was kind of handy. It, well, it at least forced me to go looking for stuff and find out, um, yeah, where it is. AK Krebs says, oh, nobody knows. Oh, I can assure you Stasis knows. That man knows. Fuck tons. It's, it's scary. Like, I'll just... Yeah. Those guys who are doing that stuff are quite brilliant. Doug Katzman and all that kind of gang. Really nice. And, uh... I'm forgetting someone. SGS? No. No, I've forgotten his name. Another guy who occasionally hangs around with the Lisp games. Um, IRC is one of the uh, maintainers for SBCL on, I think, on Spark backend. Who's, again, excellent. A great source of information. And some of them are kind of friendly as well, which is really nice. Not all. So, let's have a look at this. Let's see if this is going to compile. Or it's going to freak out, because Mandelbrot does not exist. Of course, we're not doing that. F plus is not a known function. Oh, didn't we compile that? Now it is. Good. Okay, let's split these up again onto separate lines. A little easier to read. Um, so we've got two arguments. Both of them are packed into single SSE registers, um, and which again matches SIMD pack single float. I wonder if um, Paul mentions what SIMD pack notation really is. Okay, let's have a look. This is talking about the fact that that function definition we do to define kind of the wrapper is uh, looks just like recursion. The def known will ensure the compiler inserts type checks for SIMD pack single float as needed and infers the result is also blah, blah, blah. So templates will be applicable. Nope. Long-time readers might remember that I first blogged about SSE intrinsics in 2008. The problem is that I hit some issues with representing type information, whether a SIMD pack contains integer, single float, or double. I didn't manage to find a nice resolution. I also had trouble with type operations, intersection union negation on SIMD packs of types. For the first problem, I bit the bullet and create many storage classes and primitive types, as shown above. A function can accept arbitrary SIMD packs. Oh, wow. Okay. So you can have functions that accept any SIMD pack, and so can VOPs. When converting to primitive types, unspecialized SIMD packs are treated like integer SIMD pack. Okay. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, so it'll, it'll just... By default, it'll just go, oh, it's an integer SIMD pack. Um, because it's still going to be 128 bits, so you can pack anything in there. Um, I vaguely remember something about... because. Because they're just instructions and it's just 120-bit 
128 bit chunks of memory. It, it's tempted to wonder why um, have different types. You know, if you're doing assembly, you can, you're at the point where you can make sure of that stuff yourself. It's not like the assemblers doing the type checks really for you. Um, so why add this kind of loose typing on top of it? Apparently, now this is where I'm going to fuck this up royally. Um, this was mentioned on the Handmade Hero things. Uh, this chap called Rig, who's phenomenal, de um, a phenomenal guy over at Rad Games Tools and an ex demo coder for Fabrash. Um, I think it was Fabrash. If I'm getting that wrong, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, um, came up with uh, explained the reason, and there is some kind of context switch that does go on um, for different kinds of packed of, of different kinds of SIMD operations. So getting the right types in the right place seems to matter for something. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I forget, the, the more I try and remember, the less I'm remembering. So who knows? Um, who is doing Lisp Games on Spark? I didn't say that. <laughs> I said he was hanging out on Lisp Games and he was he was doing Spark or Alpha or maybe both. I can't remember. Pretty amazing. Um, yes. It, it is a pretty rare thing. I'm not even sure if he was doing games that much, but he was just hanging out one time. And uh, we got talking about, I think it was the alpha port. Um, I'll know if it was the alpha. Yes, it was the alpha. Because of this gorgeous my microprocessor. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? Oh, lovely. Anyway, he has one of those boxes under his desk and does a load of dev work for them. And what a badass. So... Okay, so where do we get to? Da, 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 da. Yes, and we saw that. So the argument says that the X one is targeted at R, and when we looked at that, it meant that this operand is targeted to the name of operand, indicating a desire to pack in the same location. So we want to pack X into the same location as R, which makes sense to me. That bit's fine. But then when we get down to the generator, we see, hey, if the location of R is equal to the location of Y, add Y to X. Can anyone see why that makes sense? Otherwise, we move X to R and add Y to R. Now, see, that bit I completely get. And this does make sense. I mean, like, um, addition is... Is floating point addition associative? I know, like, um, in general, floating point operations aren't associative. So if you rearrange them, you will get slightly different um, results due to floating point inaccuracies. But addition should be fine, right? Um, yeah, which way around you have the operands on floating point addition should be fine. Why would why are they expecting Y and R to be in the same register to begin with when it's X that we ask to be in the same register as R? I don't really get that. It wouldn't hurt because if it just didn't do this, then this will never be done. We'll just get this instead. We'll see. Um, elevator simulator. I game exclusively on my Symbolics machine. Oh, man. That would be so cool. It would be so slow, but it would be so cool. Um, Guillaume's saying, be careful. I think you need to put defnown and vops in separate files for it to work. I don't know why. That actually might line up with some stuff I've seen before, actually. Let's have a look in the compiler and just see... Ah, oh, fuck it. Come on. Oh, I just can't remember where it is. It's com source compiler x86 64 simd pack. I did remember. Def known. Well, there is no def known in here. Let's grep for def known. Wait a second. That wasn't good. 
<laughs> don't want to be editing things. Okay, so let's have a look at arithmetic. So we've got a um, load effective address here. And there's a def known and there's a def optimizer. And there's the defun. And there is, does this, there does seem to be a vop here as well. And it is translating to that thing, so I think it might be okay. But I'm not 100% sure. We can find out. That's a really, that's some cool input, man. Or is it use of the VOP in a function? Uh, no, I don't think so, because that seemed to have the function there as well. Um, elevate simulates, elevate simulator saying add PS Y X stores Y plus X in Y. Does it not? If so, it makes sense to me. Yes, I mean it. Yeah, it is storing it is storing y plus x in y. That I don't really have a problem with. And I get that like if y is in the same location, given like it is the same register as result, then we can just do this and that's cool, right? But what I Is that cool? Yeah, I guess so. But what I don't get is that we're doing this check. We're expecting in, like, this is the only case we specialize for when R is equal to Y. Why is it not comparing if R is equal to X, given that we said that we wanted X to be the same as, uh, same register as the result? Um, I was saying, I can't remember, but I had the problem when I looked at the Mandelbrot code from Paul. Thanks, that's really good to know. Well, um, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, Elevate Simulator would love your comment on this case. Why don't we specialize R as X given target? Okay, Icky Graham saying, guess if, if R already contains Y, we just add X to it? Yeah, yeah, that's... Um, no, I mean, because R is the result... Is, is the is the temporary name for the result. Um, so I'm not sure about that. Because we're just comparing location here, not value. Uh, the other case, of course, is... Because the other case is we move X to R first, and then we move... Um, then we add Y into R. Right? So this seems to be, like... If it was like this... And like this, unless I'm unless I've got the order of um, this round the wrong way, of uh, sorry, um, okay. Add pack single precision floating point from X uh, from XMM two to XMM one and store the result in XMM one. Okay, which is the left-hand operand here. So in this case, x. Now see, in this case, seeing as we've asked target to be r, um, it kind of makes sense to go, hey, is x, r, 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 x and r already the same? And if so, just add y into that. That makes sense to me. And if not, we move x to r first, and then we add y to it. That, that fits well in my head. This doesn't as much, but... There's probably a good reason for it that I'm just being dumb and not seeing. Um, so, yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, let's go back up again to... Up here. We're not going to do the whole Mandelbrot function. I'm really not interested in that. What I'd like to do um, is just do a simple um, dot product. Symdiized. So let's go through the information here. We have this guy. And it's probably explained exactly here. So I've, I've done all this musing, which is actually healthy. Like, think about the thing before just going and looking at the answer because it will set the context up and all that kind of stuff in your head. So, 
The template converts a call with two arguments, x and y, that must both be in SSE registers of single floats. Both values must be represented as single floats in SIMD packs. When defining VOPs, types refer to primitive types, and primitive types are concerned with representation, like C types, rather than only sets of values. Yes, yeah, SIMD pack single. Okay, so there is one of the things that we were interested in before. I need coffee. Paul is saying, I'm struggling with the Wi Fi here in the hotel in Germany. If it drops out again, I'll catch back on YouTube and see you in the future stream. Great. Like, thanks for dropping by. And uh, yeah, see you on YouTube. If there are any comments or questions there as well, we'll try and get to them in another week. Um, da -da 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 -da. Okay. When defining VOPs, types refer to primitive types, and primitive types are concerned with representation, like C types. Lovely. Rather than only sets of values. A given CL value or type can be mapped to many primitive types depending on context. We also declare a preference for X to be allocated in the same register as R. The result R, if possible. The template has a single result, which is also a SIMD pack of single floats allocated in an SSE register of single floats. Fine. Finally, we have code to omit assembly. If R and Y were packed, register allocated, in the same register, we exploit commu ah, get yeah, commutative, sorry, not um, associative, to add X into Y. Otherwise, we move X into R if necessary. The move function takes care of for checking for equivalent locations and omit a single packed single float addition of y into r which has just been overwritten with a context of x damn it i didn't understand it no i mean that that is what i'm reading that is what i saw in the code um But I'm not sure in that case why we don't check this case as well. Yeah, why not? You know? Whoops. Did I just fuck that up entirely? Something going on with Peredit today, or me, more likely. <laughs> Yeah, I just don't understand the uh, the target in this case being set on the X and not the Z. Sorry, the X and not the Y. That's fine. Doesn't matter. It's going to work anyway. Finally, we have code to omit assembly. If R and Y were... Yeah, we did that bit, didn't we? The reason we have to specify the SSE registers to hold single uh, float values... So the reason we have to specify that SSE registers hold single float values rather than doubles or integers is for functions like move to emit a move of FP SSE registers rather, rather than integer, for example. However, this additional information doesn't really affect register allocation. The three storage classes, single, double, and int all map to the same storage base, and the same SSE register can be used for a single, a one point in the program and an int of the other. Yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of cool, because then on different architectures, you can have different bases and map those to different things if you wanted. And like, I know it's pretty specific to SSE in this case, but for other types, yeah, it's cool flexibility. It's nice. This VOP is the bare minimum for useful packed addition of single floats. In the future, it'll probably make sense to, support, uh, to add support for a constant argument, which could be directly loaded from a rip a relative address. Now, this... Relative addressing, I'm not sure about this. Eli is great. I can't remember what I was using some of his stuff for before. I don't know, but this looks really useful actually. Dun, 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 dun. 
Oh, it's one of the closure type people. Probably read some of that stuff a while back then. Awesome. All right, another day. Okay, so it's a kind of addressing anyway. I, I probably shouldn't try and dive into that right now. But this is extra exercises for the reader. Um, SBSEL isn't clever enough to determine when it makes sense to keep a constant in a register or across a basic block or loop. That's good to know. We'll need to come and see the implications of that later. We do the same for multiplication and subtraction. There's one last twist for um, negation. We can't exploit uh, commutivity here. Commuta commutativity. I never say that out loud, so it's weird to try and say it. So we have to make sure Y and R aren't packed in the same register. This is achieved by extending the live range of R. Again, all of these say target for X and then check Y. That is pretty great. So it's definitely deliberate. That is not a mistake. But I just simply don't understand. Let's take multiply as well because we're going to need it for our... Um... I actually need to get rid of this subtraction for now. We're going to need this for our dot product. Ah, oh, it's so funny knowing, like, it's going to be great when I know stuff and look back on this stream and just go, you fucking idiot. It's this exact reason. Um, Elevator Simulator says, okay, take a look at source compiler meta VM def. Now it doesn't make sense to me either. It seems that it should be target Y. Oh, no, really? That would be great, but also... I mean, it'd be cool because some things would make sense to me, but uh, also... Are you just telling me to go to... Oh yeah, you... we're in this file already. Where do you want me to look at in this... Um... Oh, sorry. I read, you, I read your message wrong, Elevator, sorry. Okay, you took a look at um, that thing and now it doesn't make sense to me either. It seems it should be why. It's cool. It's one of those, like, if it is a mistake, then it's a very consistent mistake. And it's a mistake that actually has zero consequences because we're telling this one that it should share with the result register. So if it does, then this isn't going to apply. So it's always going to use this anyway. I, my theory is this is always going to be the branch that's actually called. Um, but whatever, we'll see. Okay, so then he defines the recursive functions. So we can just do this. Defan f plus f4 plus, sorry, x and y, x and y. Now, that's interesting that we don't have to do, like in this one, he's just defining a macro, a local macro to do this definition. I just want to look at um, pack, oh, what is it? Simd pack make uh, single pack make simd pack okay. Um, so in these ones they do declare the types and I actually like that idea as well. They don't specify speed or anything like that. I guess that's meaningless in this case. Um, but let's just do declare um, type of x and y. Um, to be simd pack of uh, single float. Recursion in the known function. Boo! What have I done wrong? Ha! <sighs> what have I done? This, this, this. Oh, that was fine. Okay, so I guess I just hadn't done the def known or something recently. Let's just define vault and define... Whoa, don't do that. Do this. Okay, so now we have f4 plus and f4 multiply. And hopefully, then we can do this. Um, 
Make Cindy Pack single. Um, let's move this down to a new line. Ah, fuck off. Right. F plus. F4 plus this. And... This. That doesn't look right. <laughs> okay. Um... Oh, wait a second. No, it's the, um... Ah, oh, for fuck's sake. Notes the different. Plus zero, plus one. So yes, we are getting... It's 21 times 10 to the one. <laughs> That's not the most helpful representation, but who cares? It's fine. So yeah, that looks good. AK Karam caught it before I did. Um, that's great. So let's have a look at... Let's, do, let's make a function. Horse. And it's going to take... It's going to do this. Uh, let's just do declare optimize for speed. And I'm only doing this to kind of reduce some of the cruft that um, we're going to get produced by this. Um, we're also returning this, which isn't the most helpful. So let's do that. And let's... Oh, no, because then we have to print... Oh, fuck it. Let's just do it like this. Climb, disassemble, symbol. Okay, so in here now, uh, we can see that right at the top as well. Cool. Um, we've got a move APS from some address into XMM0, which I'm hoping is this one roughly. We've got a move address. Um, move from this address into XMM1. We've got an add instruction, which is our F4+. Plus. And then we've got some other stuff. So we've got an... Um, Let's just see what happens next. We've got a bunch of setup here. What does it say? Thread, pseudo atomic bits, alloc region, alloc region. There's some stuff going on here before this move APS. Um, is RDX involved? Yeah, RDX is involved. So it seems to be, this might be allocating the box that this then gets moved into. In fact, that would make a lot of sense. Um, in fact, that would make quite a bit of sense. And the fact it's moving into RDX plus one suggests that that first byte might be um, like for the type tag or something like this. Um, I have no idea, <laughs> but you know, whatever. Um, this is computing an uh, effective address and writing it into RDX and then we do this RDX plus one. Whatever. So, some stuff has happened, and that's really cool. And I love how tight this is. This is, like, literally we wanted an addition of two simply things, and we've got it right here. And that's really awesome. Now, I wanted to um, take a quick look at the comments, and then we're going to play with something else. Is the compiler implemented in class? No. Because um, it returned an object. Uh, those two phrases don't necessarily go together. More speed! Can we declare the return type to get rid of the boxing? No. And the reason is, um, like, it's got to put that value somewhere. I mean, what we could do um, is we could, like, say that this function, so if we declaim um, horse is inline, and we could also specify... Oh, one thing we could do is actually, if we specified the type of the function and then specified it to be inline and then use it in another thing, yes, the types are going to be super useful there. So let's specify f type of this to be a function of nothing to um, uh, simd pack of single float. Did I get that right? Sure, let's try that. Ah. So now we've declared this to be um, inline. It's still complaining at this point that it's um, going to have some cost. Uh, foo 
we're gonna go and do let x is going to be just calling horse and then we're gonna print x and um, return nil right and let's go here yeah, notice when we compile this we don't get the warning we don't get that message saying hey you've got a conversion cost here and now if we uh, disassemble foo we can see that our moves and all this kind of stuff are right here because this function was inlined then everything was fine it didn't have to box it to pass it like to um yeah it didn't have to box it to pass it around we actually see this a lot um Pomnipimp saying the stream is really enjoyable even uh, if I can't enter the chat. Cool, man. It's nice to know you're down there. Um, <laughs> kids pointing out that's definitely chat interaction. Um, but yes, something, something, words, something, conclusion. Ta-da. Um, okay, what the fuck are we doing? Yee. Yeah. So, Yes. Um, we see this same thing a lot in um, other code where we're trying to be quick. Um, um, let's just do declare. Actually, let's, uh, let's do a few things. Let's do an X and Y here. Declare um, optimize speed three safety on one. Uh, the type is single float x and y um, plus x y. No, okay, it doesn't mention that. Which ones can we use to express? Because in general, things are going to have to be boxed to be passed around. I'm trying to remember where I see a lot of these. I've got a bunch of them in Keppel where it's just like, hey, really? Oh, yeah, pointers. Pointers, that's one of the things. Like, there are a bunch of places where SPCL can store, th store things unboxed. Um, if you have a def struct of foo, and inside there, you have PTR, and it's um, of type... How do you type in here? Type of... Um, yeah, it's going to be CFFI null pointer is going to be the default, and we're going to specify the type to be CFFI foreign pointer. Right. It can store this pointer unboxed inside that struct, but when you take it out, it's going to have to box up that value to be able to pass it around. Um, structs accessors are permitted to be inlined and a variety of other things um, by by the common list spec, So, um, which is one of the reasons you can't just recompile structs all the time and expect it to, all, the, all the stuff to propagate, because it's a lot of stuff has been inlined. Um, so yeah, those are some of the places where you can save um, additional consing. Um, because it doesn't have to make those boxes and all that kind of stuff. Um. <laughs> Pond of people being sent away. So anyway, yes. We can avoid some of the costs uh, with inlining and stuff like that. Which is similar to, I mean, like... C++ obviously has very different things, but inlining is one of those things that can cause a lot of other optimizations to take effect, and it's pretty handy. Again, for a dynamic language, this is pretty dope. Pretty dope. Okay, so let's um, do a dot product, which, if I remember correctly, uh, for a vector three, is um, just uh, component-wise, like it's addition of component, like each component squared, right? So we want to do this. Um, and we're going to be lazy this time, and we're actually going to do it across the whole VEC4. Um, so we're just going to do square each of the components and um, then add them together. Now, this is one of the places that I was... Um, warned about when watching a fantastic talk on it was GDC and it was oh man this is gonna be hard to find now um, GDC SIMD stuff let's see um, SIMD as Insomniac Games Andreas that is the dude um, how we do the shuffle this talk highly highly recommended um, as well Um, there was another one as well. Um, let's see if I can remember that one. 
there was ooh GDC 2018 Extreme Simd optimized collision detection in Titanfall. Hello, that's something to. Uh, when is this? Oh, this is probably in the vault somewhere. It won't be out for another year or two. Ah, okay, never mind. Um, also, actually, this talk was good. I know this is just a just a really random. Um... Oh god, that's a Google link. Fuck that. Lots of links for today's stream. Um, there was a talk, and I remember there being kind of Intel giveaway at the beginning. Um, it was a GDC, and they were they were talking about. Uh, there was some play on words at the beginning, and I just can't remember what it was. Um, no, GDC ops Intel. Um, no, I can't remember what it was. I will go and find this talk because it was a really good one. Just going into stuff to do with... Um, if I remember rightly, some of the uh, micro-ops stuff from CPUs. And I think it also was talking about false sharing and things like this for um, CPU caches and shit like this. Very nice, very useful. Um... Then... Okay. Kid, I have no idea what you're talking about. And... <laughs> frankly, I don't need to. Um... Sergey's presentation is great. It really is. It's cool. Maybe check out the... Ironclad stuff at the end. Yeah, that's probably a good idea too. Um, but let's... What time have we got? we got 20 minutes roughly left. So let's do a really dodgy... Um... Oh yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. Dot product. One of the things from that talk specifically, the one, the YouTube... Um, G sorry, the GDC one that I linked, um, was he talks about um, doing vectorization well. play Actually laying out your data to um, help things be easy for you. Um, and one of the things um, that was important was okay so what happens to a lot of people is like oh SimdOps they're 4 Y. this is perfect for VEC4s or well, I'll do a bunch of my maths library stuff with SimD it's going to be awesome and so you define things like plus and multiply which fit really well and it's like oh fuck yeah SimD's great this is brilliant and then you go to do dot product as a dot product you've got a bunch of those multiplies which perfect you know like we can do all of these in um we can do this and this and this in parallel um but then we have to add them together and you've got your value um or values in your simd registers and then you want to horizontally add them wait a second is that right no this is what's the example then because adding these together is no problem that's gonna be four packs of how do they normally oh, how was the example done that he was saying Fuck, because there was just a really good little bit where, um... Oh, damn it. I was going to try and, um... Let's make sure that I haven't got this wrong for a start. It's going to be embarrassing if I haven't remembered the fucking dot product correctly. Oh, yeah. I have. Of course I have. I'm doing dot product with myself there, because I'm thinking about the, um... I was thinking about the relationship between dot product and um, squared distance stuff. I'm an idiot. So, A, X, B, X, A, Y, B, Y, A, Z, B, Z. And then you sum them all together. Um, so, yes. Right. So, you, so, it would be easy to think that you could take your... Um, Your AX, AY, AZ, or whatever, and your BX, BY, BZ, and then multiply these together, which is going to give you this first part, all the multiplies uh, down here. So you would have a vector that contained AX uh, times BX. Well, you would, yeah, you would have 
you would have a SIMD register that contained this. But then you need to add these together to get the result, which is a horizontal add. You're not taking two things and adding them together, and that sucks. Um, but the ad should be done horizontally, yes. But horizontal ads, as far as I can remember, weren't added until SSE 3, or was it 4? Um, at least it's trouble for, I think... Let's have a look. Let's look at the Intel thing. Um, and there are also... Yes, the horizontal ads seem to be... Um, for integers, we don't see that there for floats. So therefore, simply sucks, simply terrible, all of this is bad. But if you recompose the problem a bit, and instead of trying to do one dot product in parallel, um, then we can actually do four dot products in parallel, was the example, if I remember correctly. So what you do is you take um, eight vectors. So we're going to take... Uh, Um, da, 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 A0 and B0. This is so funny when you, you watch some talks and you think you remember stuff and then you try saying it out loud and it's just a fucking mess. And you realize your head hasn't stored these things very well. Um, if we were to do this, if these um, values were stored... Um, let's actually do this another way. If we have our X and Y's and Z's in separate arrays, so X array, Y array, Z array, like if they were in pointers, for example, um, then we could um, do this in a slightly different way. Um, we'll take all of the X's and multiply them with... Um, oh, fuck it. Why am I doing this wrong? God damn it. This is so stupid. I love this. This is so funny. I had this in my head that it's been like my textbook example for ages. And I, it's been rolling around in my head like, yeah, you just do this and it'll be fine. And I've just, like, I'm not able to materialize the fucking idea out of my head. Anyway, it involves splitting up the components into separate streams and then working across these uh, using SIMD. So... How do we do that? Um, makes me wonder if dot product was the thing I was meant to be doing. I mean, we could take Like this, couldn't we? So different pointers, and then we could take, we could load in um, x's um, is make sap. Oh come on, what was the fucking thing I did? Uh, where's my one? What the hell? Simd pack from sap. That's it. CMD pack from SAP. And it's that. What the fuck? Oh, make CMD pack from single from SAP. That was the thing. Okay. Let's see if we can work this out. Damn it! So we take this from X um, from X array zero. So that's a pointer to a bunch of X's. Um, the AXs and then the BXs will take that from X array 1. So that's going to be a different pointer. So then each of these is now going to be a, a wide SIMD register holding a bunch of Xs. Um, and then we can multiply those together, I think. It's going to be F4 times AXS, BXS. 
And then we can do the same for Chris. Stop being an idiot. Um, why? And then set. That's gonna be x. This is gonna be. Yeah, this is our x, this is our y, and this is our z. So those things have all been multiplied together. And then we should just be able to do um, a f four plus x and y, f four plus that and z. And in my head, Arasus is going, imagine you could just copy the internal thoughts of the speaker giving the talk into your own brain. Oh, God, that was so good. Fuck. There is an excess of excess, indeed. Excess. Great demo group, by the way. Go and watch the demos. Um, also, don't miss the next episode of Cooking with Friends. <laughs> Implementing the Akamung function with SIMD. No. I don't know what we're going to do next week. Um, not this. Not like this. Oh, yeah, that's because all of these... Because my stupid function, for some reason, takes an index as well. Um, I really don't need this. Oh, yeah. Um, let's start. Right, so... Ideally, if we can pass in a bunch of, um... If we can pass in a bunch of pointers here... This should do four dot products in parallel. The only thing here... Actually, we're gonna do, um... Yeah, no, that's fine, actually. Yeah, that's what we'll do. So it takes four x's, and multiplies them with four more x's, and gets four of these, does the same with y, does the same with z, and adds them together, and you end up with four dot products done in this space. Fuck knows if this is right, though. God damn. Dear fun. No, let's not do that. But, um, don't be an idiot. Right, so, how's the best way of doing this? Fuck the best way, let's find any way of doing this. Let's, um, do... Um, actually, yeah, with foreign, oh yes, it's not my spelling, it's the package, with foreign objects, and I'm not going to do foreign array this time, well, actually maybe we can, make foreign array, um, x, a, r, r, zero, um, lisp array, ah yeah, that's going to take a lisp array of stuff. I mean, that might be easier to write, to be honest. Um, but I think it's going to try and stack allocate it because it's really, because it's nice to us. Um, so let's not do that. Let's just lie to it and uh, let's do it. So, x, a, r, zero. And it doesn't matter if we overrun a bit today. Um, if we do, we do. Um, Fern, alloc. Uh, float count 100 and we're just going to do this 100 thing because we've had it work already <laughs> terrible y z and we're actually going to do these as separate arrays again normally um, we'd have really long arrays and we'll just index actually yeah why not um, let's just index into a different part of it we know it doesn't overlap um, so, what are we going to do? Loop for i below 4 um, for x is floats, um, no, coerce times i 10 into 
single floats. Um, actually, why are we doing that? We can just do collect. Okay, so we're going to generate um, four single floats. Um, and we're going to shove this in a little helper function labels. In a, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Pack, I suppose. It's a terrible name given that we're using pack already for something else. So. Um, do setf cfi mem a ref from pointer of float index i to this. So we're setting four floats to be um, i. I'm going to take some offset as well. Um, and we're going to call this inj just so it's got a different name for inject. And i plus um, offset. Okay, so then we've got this helper function and we're going to take, we're just going to write our set of four floats into these pointers. So we're going to inject um, some floats into XARR. X -A -R -R. Um, and the offset is going to be zero, so we're going to write um, 10, so 0, 10, 20, 30 into there. Um, and then we're going to write to CFFI ink pointer, which returns new pointer, taking this pointer. And we're going to offset in um, by four floats. And this time uh, we're going to set this to um, four. So the next four are going to be 40, 50, 60, 70. And then we're going to do this same stuff for setting up. This is a bit of a faff to set this experiment up, but hopefully, if we just get a result, it'll all be worth it. Um, foo is going to be called with um, actually, yeah, let's do uh, let's do the increments up here. X X A R R one is going to be this, this, and this. Again, we're getting right down to the line again on on a uh, time, so we're pretty sure that this is going to break somehow, um, and probably in a very obvious way. Uh, X A R R one. X uh, Y R R one. One, um, and let's keep the increments going. So eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty. And then foo is going to take x a r r x a r r one y a r r y r r one z a r r z a r r one. All of this is wrong. Because this is not right. This is saying offset is defined but never used. That's because that's offset i. Who knows? This might be a thing. If you could fucking type. Right, okay, so. We have a result, apparently. So we have, uh, apparently, the, fault, the result of four dot products. Right? Whether this was, uh, whether this is correct or not, we're going to see. So, we were trying to dot product together. Um, some vectors that were, whose x's were defined, the first set of vectors, okay. So there were four, uh, let's see if I can say this without making a complete pig zero of it. Right, so the x's for the first four vectors were stored here. And the x's for the second four vectors were here. The y's for the first four vectors were here. Y's for the second four. Z's for the first four. Okay, so... If we take the first one from each of these... 
So the first one would have been, da -da 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 -da, uh, we allocated some stuff and we incremented the pointers here. Okay, and then we inject it down here. Okay, right. So the first one is going to be, the first x would have been zero. And so we're going to have two vectors. So I'm just going to call them a and b. The x of the first one would have been zero. The x of the second one would have been um, 40, I guess. Um, the y of the first one would have been 80. And the y of the second one would have been um, 120. The um, Sorry about the, the um, very... The mixing of uh, syntax in this file. Uh, my head's been in C-sharp a lot today. Um, 160, 200. Okay, so these would have been our um, first two vector threes that we were dot producting together. And then, so that would have been um, sum. 40 times 0, which is very unexciting, 80 times 120, 160 times 200. And that's a lot higher than that. So what have I done wrong? <laughs> oh, you fucking idiot. What is it? That does not look right. What have I done here? What have I done? Probably something very simple. X and Y and Z. This would have been zero. We can just check the memory, I suppose. So let's um let's do a CFFI um, array. Let me do um. For an array to Lisp, there we go. Oh, this is hilarious. XARR array type is um, float for like that. Oh, fuck it. Let's do it for all of them. Let's just. Uh, There's probably someone yelling in chat, You idiot, you've done this! But I can't see you yet, because I'm faffing. No! What? Um, bar doesn't take anything. Pointer array type. Those look okay, are they not? Does this have to be array of whatever? No. Maybe it's array? Didn't think it was that. Oh, yes it was. Okay. Bam, 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 bam. Ah, oh, of course. Really? Oh, fuck it. I won't try and be smart then. I'll just do this. Okay. So. That's surprising. Did we not offset? Did we not offset into the memory? We didn't, did we? We just did this. But wait a second, we incremented this pointer, right? So why... Oh yeah, this is actually before we injected the data as well, so this is, should just be garbage. Oh no, so yeah, it's just garbage, it's just different garbage, that's fine, that's okay, right. Damn it, Chris, that's uh, not a helpful test. 
This is the test. Wait, you want it anyway. Okay. Yeah. So, plus times 0 and 40. Uh, um... Eighty and one hundred and twenty, and one hundred and sixty and two hundred. Oh, that's the forty-one. That's the forty-one K. Okay, so I actually just messed up. No, nope. no. <laughs> Wait a second. These are all the same as well. That looks screwed up. Is that right? That that can't be right. What did you do? What did you do? Right, sorry. I mean, I've been ignoring you. Yes, you're right, Karam. Uh, I'm still caught up with inline horse. Uh, seems you are computing x times x1, y, y1, z, z1, which is not a dot product at all. Am I... Wait a second. Oh, no, wait a second. Um, sorry, this thought this was a horizontal product. No, we're doing uh, four dot products at once. Um... I'm ignoring. E plus four, ignore me. No, don't worry. Um, there's some idiot yelling at chat. Damn, you got me from kid. I didn't realize I said idiot. I gotta be careful what I'm saying. All these uh, prints when you could use sly labels. I know. Index plus Y, you're missing the addition. Am I? Yep, that doesn't do anything. Plus offset. Oh, yeah, good point. Thank you. Um, doesn't explain what... Uh, uh. Yeah, so at least different values are packed in... Mm. What did we have before then? If I wasn't making any difference. Oh yeah, 120 all the way across, 160 all the way across. Ah, yeah. Sadly, in this case, it doesn't explain why I'm so wrong. Um, for this one. When I thought I was doing, so I take X, Right, this is XARR, this is XARR1. So what do I do with these? I, oh, look, I've interleaved it wrong. XYZ, XYZ, XXYYZZ, dumbass. XYZ, XYZ, let's try it again. 41,600. 41,600. That looks a little better. Muppet. Okay, so what we ended up doing was we were, um, we got four um, dot products in one function. Um, as we've seen, oh wow, look at all these moves. Deary me. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, moving stuff into the various uh, SIMD registers. Wow, what's this stuff for? I wonder if, see this is one of the things, like if I jump over to my, um, uh, what am I talking about? Uh, SAP stuff. If I go in here, I'm not sure I need this temporary. Um, because these guys are going to be put, this is like, we've set our storage class, so hopefully these values would already be in something. So I don't think we need to move index to index and then index to be used here. I'm thinking we can just drop this, um, get rid of that target there, and just use uh, index here. Um, and we don't need that move. 
Um, then we can go back to our thing and we can do this and we can go and disassemble it. That did not change much. Um, we are doing our move now directly from memory, which is nice. We don't have the... So RDX is already somewhere else, so... Um, <laughs> is it that we don't know these types when they're going into here? It could be. Um, Cindy, pack, single float. Oh, you fucking idiot. Of course. Sorry. Sorry. God damn. CFFI. Uh, foreign pointer. Um. Okay, that's a lot tighter. So that code that we were seeing that was, um... Bulking up the front all seems to have been um, type checks. That's kind of interesting, actually. Let's go see what type checks look like. <laughs> Just get it clean, and then now I want to go and do this. So, so this is zeroing out EDX um, before this. Racks. Jump if not equal to L7. Compare byte of PTR to 77. Jump not equal to L7. Is that... Um, yes, here we go. So down here, this is... Um, hey, look at this. This is actually quite cool. Um, why do we have so many separate things for this is not a pointer? Oh, well. Um... <laughs> Yeah, we've got a load of labels. So label seven here, we are checking something. Oh, I guess these are for different arguments. It's like telling you which one is the one with the problem. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but yeah, there is some testing stuff going on here. Test a thing, jump if not equal. Compare a thing, jump if not equal. I think that's jump not equal. I actually don't know, but... Um, yeah, and then we put this type stuff in, so we're like, super serious, we're like, promising you that is the right um, information. And then all of those type checks can go away. Um, and we can just see a few different cases down here. Uh, in fact, not many at all. Um, invalid argument count trap. And again, we could turn the safety down. Um, let's... Optimize for speed three, and then safety one. I prefer like safety one is good because it will still give you warnings if you're wrong um, about stuff. Whereas safety zero, it's going to believe everything you say, which is a bad thing. Okay, so invalid argument count trap. That's interesting. If you do turn safety down to zero, actually, let's turn a debug off and check again. Actually, if we do G over here... No, okay. I'll do that. Ah, oh, I keep on going down to the bottom of the wrong buffer. Yeah, it's still doing the uh, check for the number of arguments being passed in. Um, and if you turn safety to zero... And we do this... It is not. We've got interrupt trap stuff... We've got some labels. Huh. Anyway. There's some stuff. We're not going to leave safety like that, though. That is a dumb move. So let's just remove that for now. And disassemble again. And we look here. Okay, so we're zeroing out some EX register up here. And then we're... Actually, we do this zeroing out of EX quite a bit. I need to look at what that register is used for. And I'm not sure if I actually might have that around here. No, nah, this is just data type stuff, I think. Um, is there a normal use for EAX, or is it kind of just a regular old general purpose 
uh, register. I cannot see it here. EAX accumulator is often used for, but yeah. It's being zeroed out a lot anyway. Breaks up dependency chains and loops apparently, but that's all I know. Um, okay. Right. Um, we've done some stuff. And it's now quarter past ten. Holy shit, that went fast. Um, questions, comments, other things. Do you want to see more of this? Less of this? Um, blah, 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 blah. Yell at me, and I'm going to read what, um, yes, we have paper. I printed out some shit on uh, assembly a while ago, but I don't think that's actually one of it. I think that might be the 32-bit version, which is not helpful to me at the moment. Um, so, kid is saying, how do you do that bulk comment? I don't know what you're talking Are you talking about where you comment out a whole block at once? Um... Like, select a whole bunch of stuff, and then do alt, and then uh, semicolon. This was some stuff. Yes, it was. Um, Guillaume is saying, general purpose register. If it, if it is the zero offset in the make simd. Oh, it is. Maybe that's it is. It says if it's there, but that probably is just a typo. It is the zero offset in make simd. Oh, for fuck's sake, of course it is. Thank you. You're right. Oh, I've got, I'm such an idiot. Like, it's... Oh, no. Ah. EAX. Where are we using that, though? It's interesting that we've got this, and then we're doing RAX. Oh, wait. Oh, never mind. Exclusive or of that into itself is going to make this zero, but then we're using RAX for other stuff. I don't know. But yeah, that, that could be our zero. So let, let's actually get rid of that quickly while you guys write things. Uh, because we don't need that index anyway. Or we don't need it yet. So let's just get rid of this. And we don't need um, this. That means we don't need this. That means we don't need this. And we're fucking up everything um, right at the last second. Why am I doing this? This is just a bad idea. This is a terrible idea. Why, Chris? Why? Ah, everything's wrong. One's exactly two. No, it doesn't. It wants one. Shut up. Believe me. Expected one argument type one. Oh yeah, you're right. Type's still here. So, def known. Do this. Make pack sendy. Oh yeah, shouldn't have an either. Um, pointer costs, yada yada yada. And go back to our foo, recompile everything. It complains everywhere because now this shouldn't be here. There's another one in here. So oh yeah, there's this shit. Um, duplicate definition of foo in the same file. Yes, I know. Two notes. That's cool. We don't worry about notes. And that worked. Okay, so now let's go and disassemble that because this is how we find out stuff. Yeah, and there goes all those, um, all those things. Good, cool. Yum. AK Cram was filling kid in saying um, it's, yeah, meta semicolon. Um, Pomona Pim was saying, I'll come back uh, with a fucking decent keyboard to mess with the chat next week. Good! EAX is the lower part of RAX. Oh, of course it is. Thank you. I'm a moron. That's exactly what it is. Um, that's, again, forgetting that these aren't separate registers. They are aliased over the top of each other and one is representing, referencing part of another one. Thank you. This is the kind of stuff I just need to start getting in my head. If you get when you're an assembly noob, it's fine. Um, 
Laconic, thank you for the heads up as well. Just popped in, but the EX versus REX is a 32-bit XOR of the 65-bit X versus 65-bit XOR. I guess in that 64-bit XOR. But yeah, thank you very much. You're a star. Um... <laughs> Yeah, we still need that bell. Uh, great stream. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for hanging out. That's all I've got for now. Um, we'll definitely do something that's a little nicer to look at than some of this stuff. Um, this kind of falls into the uh, thing of laying out memory and the kind of structure of arrays pattern. And we're going to do some more stuff. I'm not sure what we'll do next week. Uh, we might be back to a pushing pixels one. Uh, we might do more SIMD stuff. I don't know. But that is... Two hours and 20 minutes at this point. It's definitely time to call it a night. Uh, ironclad. Ironclad. We'll, yeah, maybe we'll look at that next time. I'm going to look at that soon, actually. But, um, but yes. Thank you so much for the links and the help and everything else. See you soon. Ciao.